I'm super excited to be chatting with you for a couple minutes. My name is Mark Goffney, and I'm in this little conversation, I'm representing myself and my dear friend, interlocutor, and initiate in cosmorotic humanism, Zach Stein, Dr. Zachary Stein. Zach is the co president with me of the Center for World Philosophy and Religion. And we've been together with a couple of dozen other people in the inner court off on a, a great adventure. And this adventure is one in which we are, we are trying to save a damsel in distress. And the damsel is she. The damsel is reality herself. The damsel is, is if you will, and I apologize for the, the directness of it, humanity. And about 12, 13 years ago, 14 years ago, maybe it was, Zach and I were studying together in a context that I call Holy of Holies, a deep kind of interior study in the text of the lineage of Solomon and in other kind of broader philosophical world texts. And a dawning realization occurred to me at that time and to Zach from a different perspective of what we then called the second shock of existence. The first shock of existence is the experience of the dawn human being that I'm going to die. Death. The skull grins at the blank, not the blanket. The skull grins at the banquet. And the second shock of existence is not the death of the individual human being. The second shock of existence is the potential death of humanity. That's called existential risk. That's called sometimes the metacrisis. We called it the second shock of existence. But it actually has two components. One is potential death of humanity. But the second is the potential death of our humanity. And indeed, Many of the moves being made today to try and avoid the death of humanity will be cause for the death of our humanity. Now, as we, we enter deeply into this space, a number of realizations became very clear. The primary one I want to share with you is that in order to respond to this meta crisis, which is the urgent erotic, moral imperative of this moment in time, more than any other, we had to engage not just in infrastructure and in infrastructure solutions, bioweapons in the wastewater, not just in social structure, but in superstructure, the very poor, if you will, this particular take on superstructure, the very poor story of value. It's a term we coined. It's not a story. It's a story of value rooted in a universal grammar of value, an expression of a larger field of value rooted in first principles and first values, right? All of that needed to come together. This new story of value constituted by this grammar of value itself rooted in first principles and first values. And only that kind of new story. That kind of evolution of the source code itself, that kind of evolution of eros, evolution of value, that kind of new story of value could change the vector of civilization, save potentially billions of people from unimaginable suffering, and speak to the trillions of unborn. I mean, that's how serious it is, right? We're in this generation between generations. We're in this, I call it a time between stories. Zach calls it a time between worlds. And we are the link to the future and to the past. So all of the present depends on us. Trillions and trillions of unborn human beings and unborn and untold love stories from the future depends on us. So the entire integrity of the memory of the future depends on us. And the potential for the past to pass its baton to us and for us to fulfill all of her unfulfilled destinies and her unfulfilled dreams and to right the injustices and to create wholeness 
out of the shattered vessels. All of that depends on us. So what we want to share and talk about together, Zach and I, in this course is, in these four weeks are, what is the essence of this new story of value? We want to introduce four primary new dimensions that we didn't talk about in the last iteration in kind of I of value part one. And if you worked at I of value part one, it's okay. Join us in I of value part two. I get, but it's a part two that you can step in even if you haven't been in part one. And we're going to talk about what we call one scripts of desire. Reality life has scripts of desire, but as a very formal idea, not as a psychological idea, not as a mythopoetic idea. We have to move from mythopoetics to ontology. And, and we need to kind of begin to understand the erotic basis for being, which is scripts of desire. So what we mean by scripts of desire is going to be an entire week. Number one. Number two, we want to look at imagination. Imagination. What does it mean to imagine? You know, Feuerbach famously said that God is a figment of our imagination. My friend Yuval Harari, who kind of is a, a mouthpiece for postmodernity, a decent historian, terrible philosopher, but Yuval constantly talks about how values an imagined reality. And of course, he's echoing Feuerbach and that entire trajectory of modernity and postmodernity. And of course, it's true. I want to be very clear, my friends. God is a figment of our imagination. That's true. But our imagination is a figment of God. So what does that mean? So what is the role, the political role of imagination, the economic role of imagination, the mystical role of imagination, the social role of imagination, the psychological role of imagination? What does it mean to know that we are, we are Adam, but by Adam, in the original archetype, we don't mean Adam just human or humos, meaning Adam, Adama, earth. But the word Adam means not just the Hebrew Adama, earth, humus, human, but Adam means the mayon. The mayon means imagination. Adam means, right, we're not just homo sapien, we're homo imaginis. So what does that mean? And how does that relate to and speak into Scripts of desire. Three, three. We have to we have to very directly address the following issue, or perhaps we could call it the following assertion, because we're not asking it as a question. We're not doing the politically correct. Oh, let's ask this as a question. We want to actually assert something, which is value is real. Period. Value is real. Ra value is not a mythopoetic structure. Value is an ontology of cosmos. Value is not hard to find. Value is impossible to avoid. What does it mean value is real? And we want to formulate that and actually crack open value theory, which has gotten stuck in the legitimate modern and postmodern critiques of old value theory. Let's crack open value theory, value theory, but in a way that we actually literally can feel the pulsing eros of value calling and addressing us directly. And four, we want to talk about the crucial thread that we've established and we're now writing on between need, desire, value, rights, and responsibilities. That crucial five. Let's not call them the four horsemen. Let's call them five horsemen. Need, desire, value, rights, and responsibilities. We need to spend at least a week on that. So these are four huge topics. And we want to crack these open together with you in a way, and pardon me, pardon both of us, in a way that actually evolves something in the source code, that actually cracks something open, that actually moves something. You know, there's a, a phrase in the lineage of Psalm, which is called tikufot. And tikufot means to be radically audacious from a place of like absolute humility. And the place that absolute humility meet radical audacity 
It's where our truth lives, where our eros lives. It's called tikufot, T-E-K-U-F-O-T, tikufot. So we want to approach this with tikufot, with a kind of an absolute humility and a radical audacity. Let, let's do this together, but let's do this together not as an act of kind of intellectual titillation, not as an act of kind of posturing, public intellectual posturing. Let's do it because we, we care passionately about, about reality, that we are, we are lovers of reality, that we care passionately about suffering, that we are, we are stepping in. We are somehow taking responsibility. To be human is to take responsibility. To take responsibility is to respond. Right? Life is a response, response to the field of value. The field of value is real. How we respond to it is the story of our lives, right? So we're going to come together and we're going to, we're going to celebrate. We're going to be alive with this. We're going to, we're going to try and laugh it and dance it and, and cry it and, and, and think it deeply and feel it deeply. So it's from both of us, from Zach and I, just a huge invitation. Let's do this together. Right? Thank you so much to Andrew Sweeney and to Parallax for just the, the beautiful space. And I look forward to be together with y'all both too. Thank you.